There we go. Thank you. So yeah, our agenda tonight, we got through our welcome and our relational time. So we'll get into some campaign review and talking about what we've done in the month of December. And then we will get into um, Sarah Eskridge's time talking about what Democracy Found has been up to and then have some time for questions at the end. So we can get into our strategic goal here. So our strategic goal is to build relationships, promote civic engagement, and organize residents to demand that legislators pass final five voting in the Wisconsin, Wisconsin legislature in 2023 in order to reduce extreme partisanship and divisiveness in politics. And then next up is our geographic scope. And this project is focused on assembly districts 28, 29, 30, and 93, which include um, all or parts of the following counties, um, Pierce, St. Croix, Dunn, Polk, Eau Claire, and Pepin. So that is our geographic area. As time goes on, we find ourselves slowly getting a little bit out of that geographic area and spreading even further across Western Wisconsin. Um, but those are the counties in which we're most focused. So here's our campaign timeline here. So in June, 2022, we started this all off um, with our kickoff events in River Falls and Menominee. And since then we have been putting a lot of our energy toward house parties and community events. Um, house parties are our number one way of giving people an educated um, look at what final five voting is. And then community events are a good way to talk to a lot of people, um, but sometimes oh, we don't get to have that same level of in-depth conversation with them that we would be able to get at house parties. So a lot of the time at community events, our goal is to get those people to come to a house party or come to a monthly meeting to learn more about final five voting. Um, but those have been our two main, uh, two main tactics for the last several months. And then our climax tactic will be to um, pursue legislative action sometime in 2023. So once the bill looks to be coming up to a vote or a hearing in the state legislature, we will be employing phone calls to our legislators across Western Wisconsin to try to put strategic pressure on them to pass the bill. So next we can get into talking about our house party team, which um, Bob will give us an update on. Danny misspoke a moment ago. He said house parties are the number one way that we communicate this message. He meant to say House parties are the number one way I get free cheese and crackers and snacks and desserts. Yeah, that's it greatly that's appreciated. Mm -hmm. This this update is similar to what we've seen in the past. I like this slide to remind people if there's one thing you take away, I don't want people taking away details about the mechanics of how this works. I'm, I'm glad if you do, but if you take away one thing to enable you to talk with friends and relatives and neighbors, I want you to pick a benefit that you like. And there are some benefits that we rely on changing the incentives, reducing toxic campaigns, gridlock, and the power of extremists. There are some benefits that are just rock solid locked in with the change in structure. They don't re rely on incentives. And that's, it eliminates the spoiler effect and makes November general elections more important than low turnout primaries. And some are soft changes. We don't know as much about them. They're, they're more of a stretch, but they're still real in their own way, diffusing the effect of big money on politics. And even just that hope, as Bill described it, when you actually make accomplish a first step in improving elections and government. And as you can see up at the top there, Reducing toxic campaigns is the benefit that I really get an emotional yes from most people. That is the number one thing that I see most people really wanting. You can change that or go to the next slide, please. This is almost the same update you've seen. And the thing that I take away from this is we had significant growth in October and November. And then a tail off in December, and I expected that. I knew that as the holiday season hit, we'd have a, a tail off. But I was telling Carolyn Saunders a moment ago that 
even though I knew it was due to the holidays, I, I did wonder for a little bit, is it possible that with a big push by experienced organizers, like the uh, people at League of Women Voters, was that what was responsible for our uptick in October and November? Are we gonna have it tail off and never return? And the answer was no. As, as you know, through a slow December, of course, we still started to get more and more people coming in. And we've got five parties on the schedule for January, two adult ed activities, and one in our first Rotary meeting. And I'm really looking forward to that. Rotary is, it's not that everyone in there is a, is a powerful person within their city, but they are connected people within their city. And so I think those rotaries will really extend themselves. We're starting to build our, our schedule for February. That's gonna come along, I have no doubt. And March, we've already got two adult ed things going on. So I, I have no doubt that we will be able to keep this going as long as our campaign lasts. Uh, next slide, please. I do wanna answer, uh, as I've answered it, before, a, a month ago, the most commonly qu asked question is, what's the difference between final five voting and ranked choice voting? So, so do remember this, final five voting is two features, a multi-party five winner primary, and that solves many problems, plus an instant runoff or ranked choice general election. When you have, if it's all, you can almost think of final five voting as a brand name. If you've only got ranked choice voting, then that's what it's called, ranked choice voting. But if you've got both of these powerful tools working together, a multi-party five winner primary, plus the instant runoff, that is final five voting. I've ended my report, but I do have a, uh, I, I want something from this group. Could you go back two slides, please? Thank you. My daughter, uh, when I was telling her this, she said, I don't like that spoiler effect word. I, I don't know what it means. And even after I explained it, I would like people to tell me whether they prefer the spoiler effect for when a small party takes a vote and, and it changes the election, despite the fact they have no chance to win, or do they prefer the term throwaway vote? So I would love to have everyone on this put into chat either and all you have to say is which one you prefer to communicate the message. Do you prefer I say spoiler effect or do you prefer I say throwaway vote? And your, your feedback will help guide how I, how I frame this. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna turn it back to Danny for the rest of the update. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, Bill, do you want to take us to the letter writing team slide? I'm seeing a lot of good feedback on throwaway vote versus spoiler effect, which is good to see. Thank you all for letting us know. But essentially, what I would like to touch on here is that in 2023, we are launching a letter writing team to send letters to the editor to local newspapers in order to promote Final Five voting. Um, the reason for us doing this is that we, especially now, we see that we're likely going to have a much longer timeline um, than initially we had hoped, but that allows us to employ some tactics that initially we didn't feel we had time for, um, but we very much want to pursue now that we have the time. So um, we would love to send as many letters to the editor, to local newspapers as possible, and um, we have templates for letters to the editor. So if you don't want to write your own, essentially all you have to do is um, put your name in a name slot and send one of our templates to your local newspaper. Um, and also if you would like to write your own, that would be great as well. Um, and we could guide you through that process. So for our letter writing team, we will have a sign up form at the end of this meeting if you would like to join. Um, Please consider it since we would love to have as many people as we can if you're able to join our letter writing team. So yeah, thank you. And with all that said, I believe we are going to 
pass it over to Sarah to talk about um, what Democracy Found has been up to. Awesome. Thank you, Danny. Can I, I'm sorry to do this, Bill, but can we go back to that awesome slide that Bob was talking about, about house party messaging? And can I just make a comment on that? Because yeah. it was really great. Give me one sec. Sorry, Bill. You're good, you're good. <laughs> I said, I don't need slides, but then you all had great slides and now I want to comment on them. Um, fabulous. So I'm Sarah Eskrich. I've met many of you. Sorry, I just go right in without saying hi. I run Democracy Found, which is the campaign specifically working on final five voting in Wisconsin. It's all we do. It's the only policy we work on. So we're entirely focused on. So I talk about final five voting all the time with audiences that range from elected officials, um, both federally and at the state level, to kind of grassroots individuals and everyone in between. And the one kind of tweak that I would make to what you said, Bob, is actually, I think it's the system changes that change the incentives, right? So it's the structural changes that allow for those incentive changes and behavior changes to happen which you say in some ways here, especially with the words on the screen, but I think it's important to recognize that, I say this all the time, like it, just like in any industry, right? Your incentives drive behaviors and whatever systems and rules of games that you're operating in are gonna drive the behaviors in that game, in that um, industry that you operate in. And so our politics is really no different when you have a system that makes it really hard for people to collaborate because they'll constantly be threatened with a primary, they have zero incentive to collaborate because they're gonna to try to keep their job just like anyone else in any other industry. So I love um, the overview that you guys had here and just wanted to throw that little um, comment in and also appreciate the caveat, I'm just gonna to continue to lay around here, like the, the, the soft changes. One of the things that we've learned in focus grouping final five voting is that there is a concern about overpromising, right? Because if you overpromise things with people, they're going to get really skeptical of you really fast because we can't promise everything. We've only had one election example in Alaska using a system like the one that we're proposing here in Wisconsin. And so we have limited evidence to date, yet really strong theoretical basis and experimentation with these various changes in different contexts in different states. Um, but all to say, you guys are doing, and you can hide the slides, Bill, thank you, um, really fabulous work. So let me just start by saying thank you. I tell people all the time, the biggest thing you can do is spread the word and have conversations with people in your network. And of all groups, I think you all have really taken that and run with it more than anyone else. And the number of house parties and conversations that you're having it's just a huge contribution to Final Five voting because, as you all probably know, no one knows what Final Five voting is. <laughs> and so we don't tell them. And if we don't tell them from a trusted relationship of someone they know, they're going to learn about it over time in other ways that are going to cause skepticism. Because one of the great kind of national bits of progress is that we are actually making progress in other states on final five voting and on versions of final five voting. I already alluded to the fact that Alaska has used a final four voting system. This election cycle I threw into the chat just for those of you who are interested in a reference, a really good overview article um, that was recently published about Alaska and what happened there and some of those incentive changes as well as to how people responded to campaigning in this new system, which is really interesting. Um, and Nevada passed final five voting on their ballot for the first time. They'll need to pass it again before, it's in, before it can be implemented as a constitutional amendment there. Um, but what we saw was that when we take the question to voters, um, the Nevada results were really telling. It was a very, very competitive election year in 2020 in Nevada. You had a lot of money being spent on their gubernatorial and Senate races, both very competitive races. And races that at the top of the ticket split, just like they did here in Wisconsin. You had one go to the Democrats and one go to the Republicans. And ballot measure three, the question for final five voting, got more votes than either of those races. So people who were not voting for either of the candidates at the top of the ticket in that very competitive election were voting for final five voting in Nevada, which I just love to share with people because it shows that Everything we say about this being truly systemic 
um, and not as advantageous to one party or another becomes true when we have these examples where originally it was the Republicans in Alaska who resisted final five voting there or final four, four voting there, and it was the Democrats in Nevada who resisted it. So when you're making every, you know, both parties mad in different states, depending on who's in control, you must be doing something right um, and making some progress. So all that to say, there's a lot more attention starting to grow on this election system and on electoral changes in general. We saw that a lot in 2020, 2021, 2022, um, post the 2020 election. And that's been both an opportunity and a real challenge for us in this movement for Final Five voting in Wisconsin, because it means that people are starting to hear things from other messengers than the trusted messengers that you and I are when we're having conversations with people in house parties. So to the extent that we can get ahead of that and have the conversation continue to be an introduction from someone that they already know and trust, it's going to open them a whole lot more to when they're hearing pushback, opposition, whatever it may be, skepticism in the press nationally or support from a group that they don't trust in, in the press nationally, all of a sudden they think, but, oh, wait, Bob told me about that and Bob's pretty okay. So I think I should think twice about this, right? It's that sort of trust building um, that's really, really important in this campaign for Final Five voting right now so that we can do what we need to do, which is make sure that this issue remains cross-partisan because the biggest thing that we could do to make final five voting impossible in Wisconsin to ever get passed through our state legislature is to make it a partisan fight and make it seem like it's going to hurt or help one side or the other and be biased in our support on, you know, one way, the right or the left needs to be balanced. And if anything, lean more heavily towards Republicans and conservatives because they're in charge of the Wisconsin state legislature and are expected to be for the, you know, near term future. So as long as we have um, that dynamic at place, we, we know kind of our marching orders, which is in Wisconsin, we have to get a bill passed in order to implement final five voting. And so our audience is ultimately a different audience than people who are focused in ballot initiative states on voters. Our audience is ultimately legislators. And so the strategy of making sure that we have cross-partisan leaders in communities who give that support to legislators for this is the sort of political cover that's required for legislators to move big change like Final Five voting forward. Okay, that's enough opining from Sarah. Um, let me tell you where we're at in Wisconsin and what the path forward looks like. So we, um, Democracy Found, had a really good 2020. Our election cycle went really well. Some of you have heard this update already, so apologies for being repetitive, but we did a lot of election work in our 501c4, so our political advocacy arm and democracy found action this cycle where we engaged directly with candidates on final five voting. We supported them politically with hard dollars to their campaigns and we met with them in their districts to, to talk to them about final five voting with a trusted messenger um, whenever we could from their party, a donor in their community to help set up that meeting. Um, and that allowed us to have a new class of legislators who are coming in, who have already learned something about final five voting, who have already had some reason to think about it. And, and when we are moving forward with our path to bill reintroduction and passage, ultimately we've got some at least open ears, because what we've learned is it takes multiple conversations with anyone, not just legislators. I mean, I'm sure you all are learning this as well, but people need to think about this. It's a way of changing how we vote, which is a big deal and an even bigger deal if you're a legislator who's been elected under a system in one way, and then you talk about changing that system of how you get elected. So often the knee-jerk reaction is, eh, I don't know, I'm skeptical. Uh, you know, tell me more. Okay, let's learn more um, until we finally get to a point where people are much more open to it. And we've made that progress over four years in our state so far of conversation. So it's not a new push or a new conversation. It's one that's been ongoing with, legis with legislators for two years with broader kind of grass community for four years in Wisconsin. 
and it's starting to make make some progress. However, I will say we we weren't sure, right? We had this big election push to see what could happen and what would happen, you know, with the gubernatorial race in terms of where the political power was going to fall in Wisconsin and thinking about what that would mean for final five voting. What happened is we have we continue to have divided government in Wisconsin. And so for anything in our state, right, any big legislation, that means we're just going to have a challenging political environment to get things done. Because when there's divided government, it makes any passage of anything more challenging. Um, because as we've seen, this legislature and governor don't have much of a history of working very well together. They claim they're going to work on that. They've uh, started to have meetings with each other. But we'll see uh, when push comes to shove whether things actually get done, and whether there are deals to be made between this legislature and the governor. But what that means for us in the push for final five voting is there's not going to be some sort of like Hail Mary deal, big kind of, this is going to move forward quickly. It's going to continue to be a long haul effort. It's going to continue to be something that's going to have to build over time. Um, so from a 2023 plan forward for democracy fund action and for final five voting, from my perspective, where we're at with the legislature is we want to spend really the the legislative cycle is two years. Let me step back, right? The legislative cycle is two years in Wisconsin. The first six months almost of the legislative session is generally spent on budget. So the legislature is going to be talking about the what $7.5 million surplus that they're um, dealing with. And they're going to be talking about allocations, about money, 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 money. Not much else. And so we're going to use that time to go back to have conversations with the legislators who are now elected officials who we met on the campaign trail to rebuild our coalition of bipartisan support for final five voting. We lost some of our legislative champions because they didn't run for reelection. And so we need to re-secure new legislative champions, particularly on the right for final five voting. Um, you all probably are well aware, but our champion um, on the left, Senator Smith, Jeff Smith, was reelected. Um, so he will be back and he is continue, he continues to be very committed to final five voting and supporting the effort. And we're really happy to be working with him. We just need to make sure that he has partners on the right in the state Senate that he can work on this with in order for it to actually move forward because democratic support is not enough to get anything done in the state legislature. So we've got some really good prospects, some good co-sponsors already lined up, and we just need to follow up with them and get redrafted bill language, recirculated, uh, and take the time really over the next six months to make sure that when we do recirculate the bill for co-sponsorship and reintroduce it, ideally in the early fall, we have a bigger number of Republicans on the bill than we had last session. So if you remember, we had 22 co-authors or co-sponsors on the bill for final five voting last session in Wisconsin. The majority of those co-sponsors were Democrats. I'd like to see that flip this time. Um, and that's going to take a lot of work and a lot of conversations. And so we're really concentrating on that for the first six months of this year. We then hope to introduce the bill when they come back in the fall session, when they really start kind of the more legislating session of actual bill convert bill policy bill conversation as opposed to budget conversations um, in the fall and work on getting hearings in ideally the assembly and senate elections committee looking very likely or at least more likely in the assembly elections committee this session uh, as opposed to last session when we did get a hearing in the senate elections committee so a lot of insider politicking going on um, and conversations to be had but I think top line is what that means for our partnership and the work that you all are doing is that all of these house parties and education events that you're doing are really important because it lines up people to be supportive when we do go out for bill introduction and have hearings this fall to have people in districts in the key districts that you all are in ideally conservative Republican independent civic leader voices who can thank these legislators for being supportive or encourage them to be supportive when the bill is moving forward. Um, so we've had side conversations about individuals and outreach, and I'm always happy to do that. Uh, like I said, it's my job to do this all the time. And so I'm happy to have 
one-off conversations about relationships or individuals that you think we should be targeting or opportunities to kind of amplify messages with legislators in the near term if you think there are opportunities, particularly with Republicans in the area and, and trusted people on the ground, you might be able to talk to them. Um, and I can give you an update on any specific individual and where we're at with them at, at a certain period of time when that's relevant and helpful. But overall, I think the trajectory is that final five voting is it's the right thing. And ultimately, the right thing often is what happens. Um, and it sometimes takes more time than we would like it to. I know I personally, like I said, I've been working for four and a half years on this. Um, it's hard to work on something for a long time. And yet when it's absolutely the right thing to do, and I always say I have no intention to lose, but it's definitely a fight worth losing. Um, and uh, so I'm optimistic that over time we'll be able to get this done. I just think we need to be realistic about what we can achieve under divided government in Wisconsin right now and continue to build the, the type of support that is needed to actually move a bill through the Republican controlled legislature here in our state. And that's amplifying conservative voices for this policy change while also making sure that we well, you know, we keep our Democratic colleagues in the bipartisanship moving forward as well. Um, so I just viewed a lot at you all. I think maybe I will pause and see what questions you have and we can take the discussion in whatever direction is most helpful for you all. I have a question actually, and this is um, not so much focused on Wisconsin. Um, it's more focused on, you know, final five voting as a whole. Obviously, Alaska has passed it. Nevada is on the path towards passing it. Um, I know Democracy Found has talked about in the past wanting to have five states by 2025. Is that right? Um, with final five voting, do you know what other states are on the path or um, talking about putting final five voting forward? Yeah, so about half of the states have binding ballot initiatives and about half of the states are like Wisconsin where we don't have binding ballot initiatives. So, so far, the two states that Danny mentioned and I mentioned are ballot initiative states that have moved final four and final five voting forward. We expect that trend to continue, that it is ballot initiative states that move most quickly on this because you can take the question directly to voters. Um, they're expensive though. Ballot initiatives are very, very expensive from a campaign perspective because you're competing at the same time as candidate campaigns, trying to bring a wonky issue to light amongst the electorate and convince them to change the way they vote in a 30 second commercial. And for those of you who have been at events, you know what it's like to try to tell people about this in 30 seconds. It can work. It's been successful, um, but, it's, it, but it's a challenge. So the, the next couple states that are on the 2024 ballot initiative trajectory, um, there, are, there are quite a few that are being vetted right now, actually. Um, between five and eight states are being vetted. And the key is to make sure that there really are strong supporters on the ground who are going to lead and carry this effort forward. Because what we learned is um, that was really true in Alaska. It was create the ballot initiative there was really ground up. And that was also true to some degree in Nevada, but Nevada became a very nationalized conversation pretty quickly because it's a battleground state. And so some of this is to make sure that the next states that go are states that can really carry it from a local support perspective with some national funding and support coming in, but that there's enough on the ground to, to move it forward. So some of the states that are being floated right now include Utah, Missouri, Arizona, um, Oregon, uh, Idaho, Wyoming, South Dakota, there, there's a lot. Um, and the question is just gonna be, which of those can materialize into a viable campaign for the ballot in 2024? And which of them are gonna need to be longer trajectories? 
states like us, so in terms of legislative states, I also spend a little bit of my time advising a nascent effort in the state of Georgia. So Georgia is really trying to follow our model of legislative state change. They've got some pretty unique circumstances on the ground because they are the only state that still has general election runoffs. And so as we've experienced in the past two national cycles in Georgia, that's been a bit of a headache for them. And so there's an interesting conversation happening in Georgia right now about how to get rid of the runoffs. And, and final five instant runoffs are part of that conversation and will likely be in their legislative kind of four year trajectory of potential passage um, under their governor. And they actually have single party control. So in some ways um, that makes passing a big piece of legislation more possible. I, I hesitate to say easier, um, but it, it just because single party control makes moving big things sometimes a little bit smoother. Yeah, another question. Jump in. Me? Yeah, please. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so would um, binding or even non-binding ballot initiatives at a city or county level be helpful? It's a great question and one we've considered a lot because it is something that other advocacy campaigns have, have used as a tactic. One of the things that we've seen is that it hasn't really pushed the legislature to act, unfortunately. And there are really, there are, I don't think I should tell many of you, it sounds like some of you are, have been involved in those. They're, they're not an insignificant list. Um, and so at this point, we don't believe the list for them is worth the potential payoff but I reserve the right to say that strategy should change in the future. Um, but for now, we are making progress with the legislature in the way that we're building this base, basically relational networking campaign for Final Five with them in a way that I think is actually more powerful than um, non-binding initiatives at the state level at this point in time. But at some point we may decide, look, it's time for public pressure. And if we can get some non-binding initiatives in, it would be helpful. But that, that has not proven to be persuasive in getting the state legislature to act on other nonpartisan electoral reform issues in our state. So it's not something we're really focused on at this, at this time. That's a great question. I believe there was, Janie had a question in chat. Are you oh, reaching out to legislators you. in your area or statewide? Um, da, 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 da. Okay, so statewide, yeah, Democracy Found is a statewide organization. Um, and so we are very much focused on growing the support base all across the state and trying to make sure that we have um, Republican and Democratic leaders, but particularly those, um, I call them grass tops, but like donor class, community leaders, people who have influence with the legislature to help um, make, have those conversations. That's what I mean when I say relational networking and advocacy. It's kind of bringing in the people who already have the existing relationship in their area with state legislators and with members of Congress to have those conversations. And so considering our political makeup, you do need more, you know, we have more Republicans in our delegation and in our state legislature than we do Democrats. So in some ways we do lean to get a lot of Republicans on board, but not to say, I mean, at our launch event, we had the biggest, one of the biggest democratic donors on stage with a Trump house party host. Um, and they said, look, we don't agree on politics, but we can come together on this final five voting thing because it's actually just about having a good system and make sure that it works for everybody. So. Uh, da, 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 chain reaction. Yes, Pat, absolutely. Looking for a chain reaction for sure. Um, George, you have your hand up. Yeah, so um, since uh, I, nobody's got a lot of logisticals, I have a big picture question, curious question more. What is um, um, Catherine Gill's 
uh, day-to-day work. She talked to politicians, she talked to corporations. What does she do? She's the big sales pitch person. She's the, the owner. She has to sell this all over. So what does she do every day? <laughs> I love that question. So yeah. George, and you all might not know Catherine Gale, so i just tell you who George is talking about. Um, Catherine Gale is the board sh- co-chair of Democracy Found. She's also the person who essentially originated this idea of putting a top five primary together with an instant runoff general election branded at final five voting and wrote the book, The Politics Industry, which really lays out that business case for final five voting, because as she found, it was really, in her experience, frustrating that there were so many political donors who were just writing check after check to try to have these change candidates come in and fix things when ultimately if you send people into a broken system, nothing changes. And that realization and then translating it into a business case for leaders to speak that language was a really, I mean, it's been a light bulb moment for people, I think all across the country, particularly business leaders to recognize the value of investing in systems changes like final five voting. So her job really in many ways is to continue to do that. Like winning, we call it winning minds, which is how do you get people like who need to be convinced of this, whether it be the donors, the media nationally, and others to kind of that chattering class to recognize final five voting as a solution to so many of these challenges that we see. Because one of the things that I'm sure you all experience, I know I do all the time, is that now that you know the promise of final five voting, you see the problems that our current system is causing everywhere, right? You can't watch this speaker vote again and again and again and again in Congress right now and not think, gosh, it's the system, people, right? Like, this is why we're getting these results. And so the value is to put that seed in everybody's head so that they recognize the problem statement and therefore that there's actually a solution out there that can solve it. Um, So she's got to bring the people in who can put the money in to win these ballot initiative campaigns, George. That's really her priority work. Uh, it's a lot of raising, a lot of millions of dollars. Tell her to keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. Will do. Any other questions for Sarah that anyone has? Feel free to either. Sarah, oh, yes. I'm wondering, um, what about doing an interview um, you know, I keep, my husband and I keep thinking why we're not hearing about this um, a lot. What about an interview like on WPR or TV stations or something like that? Yeah, Darlene, I appreciate the question. We've done some. And so amplifying those that have been done in the past is always great. The challenge with the news media is that it's so clickbaity and there's not a hook right now. Um, So there are there are these hooks that we all know, right, we can make the connection between what's going on in the speaker's vote in DC, back to the electoral system, but but to get Hill reporters and political reporters to do that is a much bigger, more challenging leap. So we continue to work on that and and try to make those points and make those cells when we can. Um, But it, it has been challenging, I will say, to get members of the media to really dig in, um, especially when so much is so just kind of responsive to what's going on in the moment. And there's nothing on fire about Final Five right now. So when there will, when there is a hearing, you'll see a push. You'll see us. When we had a hearing last session, we had some great interviews on local news media about the bill, both myself and legislative co-authors were on talking about it. We'll have that opportunity again when we have hearings and when we introduce the bill, but when there's not some sort of a hook, it's hard to get in there. But I do think that the value of, as thank you, Wendy, your comment is so absolutely right. Um, Control of the message is really important and messenger is really important too. So we, We've been trying to work on um, 
making sure that we're outreaching to some more like conservative media and using those sorts of messengers um, to tell the story to the audience that we ultimately know is most skeptical and also most important to persuade because we need them if we're going to get this done. And some of that sequencing is really important. And those are harder, harder spots and in interviews and people to get. And so sometimes we don't take the easy ones because it's better to work on the harder ones and do those first so we don't get in our own way in the long run, um, if, that, if that makes sense. But um, kind of from an archive perspective of media that we've shared, um, and Bob put this in the chat, but the, the Twitter and Facebook accounts for both Democracy Found and the Institute for Political Innovation nationally have a lot of like Catherine Gale's interviews that she's doing across the country and the interviews that we've done in the past. And so any amplification of those um, is great. Please, please do send them to your network. Any other okay. questions for Sarah at all? I'm sorry, I might have missed it. Um, when do you anticipate this is gonna come up in Wisconsin, in the in, legislature? The goal is to reintroduce the bill. So we introduced the bill last session. It had bipartisan support, so it needs to be reintroduced this session. Um, we anticipate our goal for doing that is sometime in the early fall. So when they come back in after the summer recess. Yes, thank you. Any other questions or comments for Sarah? All right, thank you, Sarah, for sharing with us. Um, before we all sign off for today, I'm going to drop a link to a form in chat. And this form, like I said earlier, is if you want to sign up for our letter writing team, or if you'd like to sign up to host or attend a house party if you haven't gotten the chance to already. So um, if you have any interest in doing those, fill out those forms and say yes. Um, even if you are a Mamie right now, um, we'll be in touch and I'll probably try to convince you to be a full yes. But um, thank you everyone for joining and fill out those forms if you can for sure. So yeah, thank you everyone. And I hope you all have a very happy new year and a happy 2023. Thank you to Sarah for joining us tonight. And I'm glad you were all here to um, see what the update is on final five voting. So yeah, thank you everyone. Thanks everybody. Good night everybody. Thank you. I did hear the captioning was good for you, Pat. We added that at the end of last year and I'm glad it's helpful. Danny, did you get any response from Sarah offline to our question? Uh, yes, at the beginning, and you can stop recording, Bill. Um, but at the beginning of 